So I'm Penny, uh, I'm a research scientist at BBC, uh, specialising in user experience research. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a bit about my role, my backgrounds, uh, how I got to where I am, um, a bit about kind of real, real world UX research, um, and how perhaps learning in a classroom is kind of different from doing it in the field. So, research scientist doesn't really mean anything, most people don't know what I do. Um, I think this is research. Um, I'm actually a behavioural research scientist, um, when people don't understand what I do, otherwise I'm a UX researcher, but being at a BBC R&D, they like to make a sound important to the goodness scientists. Um, so my background is in psychology, and then I did a master's degree um, on user experience, in practice of user experience, for example, um, and focused on user experience, usability methods, interaction design, and prototypes and technology, so kind of a mixed bag of stuff. So, I'm a user experience researcher. I'm not a designer, but I did used to do design. Uh, but that's not kind of the principle of my job now, it's more research based. Um, and so within uh, research development, these are the kind of things that I would do on a day-to-day basis. So uh, literature reviews, so basically we have to become experts in a field very quickly. Get pulled into a new project with a new device, new system, new experience. We've got to know exactly what that is straight away in order to start informing the design. Um, Things like sampling of participants, I'll talk about that a bit later. I've got a few projects that I can use examples from. Um, the main part of my job is designing experiments, whether that's field based or lab based. Sometimes we go to people's homes, sometimes we use people's work, sometimes we bring them into our lab, which is what people are like um, Analyzing data, um, which is a huge area, quite complicated, but I'm not really expected to do, qualitative and quantitative. Um, writing reports and recommendations and lo-fi prototypes as well, you kind of are expecting to do things like wireframes and suggestions for design. So this is where I work, this is our lab. So this is where we want to do quite a controlled experiment, we can bring people into the lab. Um, it's meant to look like a living room, it's a bit like a bachelor pad, basically media cities quite um, new and over designed, therefore our lab had to fit in that as well. Um, and this is our control room, so we've got a one way mirror. Um, that's in pitch black when we're sat in there, we have note takers in there, people just writing down everything that's happening. There's wall mounted cameras, you can't really see that white bubble on the wall, we can move those around and we can zoom in with them. Um, we've also got mics on the ceiling. I can't really see that either. Um, and so we can listen in the control room to everything that they're saying and write down everything that they do. So on the screens there, we'll also see what they can see on the screen, whether that's computer or TV. Uh, we've got base at the back here that's for computer research, so anything on a PC. Uh, recently we've had children in looking at a CBBC website, and um, we'll do that at the back, much more focused in the corner, but a lot of the time it's watching the TV. <clears throat> so, generally what I do now, it's all about understanding people and technology, but within the media <coughs> So anything to do with the services or new technologies, that can be production-based stuff, or it can be consumer-facing stuff. So we could be helping the people in the studios with new technologies, or ultimately understanding the experiences people are having at home consuming our content. So, um, just to give you an idea of the range of different types of projects I do and therefore the kind of skills that you need to be a UX researcher, um, this is very much a um, start of a project. Uh, we wanted to build a voice inter user interface for TV, so uh, initially so visually impaired people could search for programs, um, plan their listings, what they want to watch and things like that. Um, we don't really know anything about them. So we brought them in and um, interviewed them, but very basic stuff. We want to know what they do now, what problems they have um, interacting with their TV now, what would they like, what do they think of a voice interface, and how would they expect that to work. We haven't built anything yet, we're just basically gathering some requirements at the start to feed into how we would 
uh, that start to build that system or prototype that system. <coughs> So I've got um, a video of one of part of one of the sessions so you can see what how the kind of interview goes. <coughs>
much as I complain about it, it is very useful because you become very familiar with your data that you're being given. Um, and also, you, you, when you come back to read it through, you can remember parts of it. So it's much easier to analyse if you transcribed it, but it is a nightmare. So I won't lie, in, when normally when we're working, we generally will pay somebody to do it because we just don't have the time to spend. I had six participants in each an hour. 36 hours of transcription, that's a bit of a waste of my time. Anyway, so this is the kind of output you get, so then you can read through and um, basically when we're um, analysing the data, we won't be looking for anything in particular, we'll just go through and pick out the really interesting points that they say. So I've highlighted there some of the points that I would pick out that kind of have an impact on what we're trying to achieve with their voice system. So you've got things here, um, so basically trying to understand what she does at the moment um, and do we want to fit into her current behaviour or do we want to give her an opportunity to do something new? So instead of having to go to the, the computer and look up TV listings, the voice interface the TV is ultimately going to take that step out so she doesn't have to dedicate half an hour of her day going and looking what's on the TV. Um, so this kind of thing we would pull out and can, and then we would put together a, a requirements document which will cover things that um, it should do and things that it must do. Um, and a lot of these can be from what she does now or a lot of the things came again from her expectations of the system. So as you can see here, so she still wants to browse the TV but she can't really. So that gives us um, kind of a tick for it's worthwhile doing it because again some of the time you should really start with talking to users to see if there's any point in building this system it costs a lot of money to build something like this and if nobody really wants it then it's just a waste of our time and money um, she talks about how um, she relies on other people so we want to give her independence which is what she talks about a lot later she's got a guide dog now to give her independence to go out on her own which she would never dream of doing before. She has to wait until people come home to read out the TV guide if she can't be bothered to sit on the computer and look through it herself. So it's all about kind of promoting that independence, making sure that she can watch TV on her own. And also, um, it's interesting that she points out that um, until somebody shows me something different, basically, she doesn't, she doesn't know. She has no frame of reference. She was blind from birth. So she has no frame of reference unless somebody teaches her something new. So this voice system really has to work with sighted people as well in order for them to be able to interact with the family and her feel comfortable using the new technology. So it's that, those kind of things that we get out of this very early stage. They're, they're, they're quite loose requirements, but ultimately we can infer some things about how this system should work. Um, this, this is another project um, that I did um, with a design team um, and it was accessibility focused um, and looking at typography, text on TV. Um, basically there's some guidelines for design on TV, they come from some very, very poor research that was done that's very unscientific and it has become Ofcom's regulations, they tell us how big text has to be, what type of text we should be using but all of it is based on very loose findings. So we decided to look at it because we're not just producing subtitles and teletext anymore. We are now we have red button services where text is being shown with video and images and different colours and things going on on the page. We don't really know what those decide, uh, decisions we're making around text, what the impact is. And also our audience is really diverse. So we have uh, a large amount of older users who uh, invariably have certain type of access needs, whether that's that they wear glasses, they have poor eyesight. Um, so we really want to think about the kind of needs behind those type of users as well when we're thinking about text on TV. There's no point in us putting text on TV if people can't read it. So um, initially, um, research I was on the team at the time, research was carried out in the area looking at typography and they did a study with different types of participants but also um, included participants with cognitive, uh, cognitive um, impairment. So <coughs> a 
ADHD, um, dyslexia, and things like that, um, where reading text on TV can be quite difficult for them. Reading text in, in other types of situations can be quite difficult for them. Um, and they looked at all different types of typography. They looked at different fonts, which was the most preferred font, different sizes, which was their preferred size, different colour combinations. And when I joined the team, basically we wanted to put together some guidelines of um, size of the text. So I was brought in to isolate the size variable in the experiment. And so that's kind of where this comes from. This one's a bit of a promo video, it's a little bit cheesy, but I'll show you because it gives you an idea of kind of what we did. Participants were split into two groups. They were either assigned to a serif font or a sans serif font. The serif font was matched for dimensions but just had serifs. The sizes of the text that we used in the trial, the default sizes that come up first, are the sizes that we currently use in our guidelines for designing for TV. We start with a setup screen, which is to provide us with some ground truth their comfortable reading level on TV. First question we ask them is what they're drawn to on the screen. Uh, it gives us an idea of attentional focus when these screens come up. We would ask them what they think about the size of the text on the screen, and we would ask them to read part of the text on the screen to assess legibility in its current form. Then we would ask them if they wanted to see any of the text parts any bigger or smaller for them to set them to their preferable reading level. The text was made up of different parts. So we had the body text, the subheader, and the main header. And I would go through each part and ask them whether they wanted to see it any bigger or smaller. Three of the screens look at the ratio between video to text to understand the interaction between the text and the video and whether that has an impact on the legibility. One of the screens was a scores table with the video playing behind. And we looked at the different text elements. And I reduced the size of those to find their smallest acceptable size for each part of the text, so the header, the subheader and the body. The idea for the subheader and the header text was to find the threshold of the point where it started to lose its distinction from the other text. One significant finding was the difference in the older user's smallest acceptable font size and the younger user's smallest acceptable font size. The impact that has on the guidelines font size, it means that we have to concentrate on the older user's smallest size, which means that the threshold of acceptable size that we can use within our designs is reduced. So they were over 65. So 
basically I was just taking a sample of our audience and assuming that there would be some accessibility needs within that sample, which I did record. So a lot of them wore glasses, some people, uh, somebody had macular degeneration. And so you, you just got a general sample of what these people are, you know, in the population. Uh, we didn't want to pick on any access need in particular, we just wanted a nice range uh, to look at older users in particular. Um, so uh, one aspect of what we developed um, was this, you know, exper experimental design is really, really important. Um, and one aspect of this is you can't, or you can sort of see my laptop in the corner there, that's where I'm sat. On that laptop, I've got a completely different screen to what they can see. My screen is a tool that can change the font size by one point, by the way. Um, what you get with the participants, um, and they found it in the first round, is they want to be consistent. Every time you change the screen, they'd say, oh, is that the size I chose last time? You don't want them to do that. You want them to choose the size that's best for their reading level. So um, if we took that away from their screen. So they can't see the numbers that they're choosing and things like that. You're just going, do you want it any bigger or smaller? It's going up so incrementally that they can't really tell whether it's the same or not. Um, and every time it changed screen, we defaulted the size back to um, the size that we would be designing in any way. So they always had this kind of ground of where they started. It never started from their last choice. <coughs> so um, kind of a big part of my job as well is really methodology, designing methodology and really um, researching methodology. It's not just, there's no right or wrong way, generally, when you're doing UX research. Sometimes you don't, there's no, there's no book that says this is how you test with blind participants. You, you kind of have to use your common sense. And you go in and you trial different things. So I look at past research and I look at flaws in that and think, well, how can we improve that? Hence with this, so we took the, the tool off of the main screen so they can see it. Because I know that was impacting their choices. Um, So, um, as I was saying, kind of we're, we're sort of expected to be experts in whichever field we walk into. That's partly why we do a literature review. Um, another point that we have with TV is, is typography is not the same on a piece of paper, on a computer screen, and on a TV. They're completely different environments. They render the font differently. Um, so one part of the experiment was standardising things. So I had a lot of quantitative data that came out of this. I had to standardise certain aspects of the environment in the experiment in order to make sure that I was keeping it consistent and it wouldn't have an impact on the size. The distance they sit from the screen, the size of the screen, impacts the size that the font is, what they see. So the, you can actually work out a visual angle trigonometry coming screen with that um, so you've got the distance of the screen you've got the physical size of the font on the screen you can actually measure that with a ruler which we did um, you've got a millimeter size you know an angle then you've got your distance you've got that's how big the font is and then you've got a visual angle that's the exact size that they see not the size necessarily that's on the screen it's just a more precise it's actually the size that's imprinted on the retina it's really scientific. None of this I knew before I started. I thought, oh, it's quite easy. It's you know, it's just typography. No, it's really complicated, and it was really difficult to actually um, analyse all the data. But it's all these kind of things that you have to uncover quite quickly in order to start doing research like this. So, um, as I said, a lot of quantitative data. Um, we do a lot of poll, which is what you saw on the last project, and this. Um, masses and masses of quantitative data and a lot of things, although I'd isolated the size variable, there were a lot of things that could impact that, the different screens, the, the different types of participants and things like that. I also um, varied the layout, the, the video was on the right and then for some participants it was on the left. And I had to see if that had an impact. It didn't, but I still have to do that in order to find if that has an impact on the size they choose. So when um, analysing the data, this time I used Excel, I didn't need anything too fancy. I don't know if any of you have used SPSS, but it's hell. Um, but you might use it, I imagine, when you're being taught. Well, I'm sure they've sorted out the UI since I've asked you to. 
Um, but yeah, a lot of the time, just dump it into Excel, have a play around with the data. So um, what I was trying to find here is, is testing the significance. Um, so basically, I want to know if these two groups, the older users and the younger users, are statistically different from each other, the choices that they're making. So I've just done a simple t-test at the bottom here that basically told me there's a significant difference between the smallest acceptable size, the older users and the younger users for choosing. And obviously that has a massive impact, like I said in the video, on the, the size recommendations that I can make because they have to fit with the older users because their threshold is much higher. Lower, which I like. Um, yeah, so once you've done um, a kind of statistical t test or an analysis or something, all it's telling you is if there's a relationship. It doesn't tell you what that relationship is. So generally, you go back to the mean data that you've got and unpick it. So that's why the graph there, it shows you. You know, what is the difference there? Oh, it's that the older users have a much higher, smallest size that they'll choose. Each project has a different kind of outcome. My audience for the outcome of this project is actually designers. Um, so, uh, what we're trying to achieve with them is giving them parameters of what size of text they can design in. Um, at the moment, they don't know, they just need yes. So, we put the scientific data into this, um, things again that impact the, the size that you can choose, screen resolution and what resolution you design in and all of these other body areas, so that's all gone in there as well. They could set, you know, average screen size, average distance and then it would give them the different types of size that, that they would be able to design in. So I think the other thing from this project was that there wasn't just one answer, there's not just one number. It's, it's so variable within the environment that we were testing it that we had to account for that when we were giving them a tool to use. Um, this is uh, another project that <laughs> I've been involved in um, and this was basically designing an online survey in order to assess the mood of theme tunes. Um, it was a bit out there, we didn't really know anything, there was no literature, so me banging on about literature reviews and yet yeah, there was nothing for me to read. Um, so we just had to get. Um, so uh, this was called Musical Moves, um, and basically it was about gathering a lot of data. We worked with the, the British Science Association at Salford University as well. Um, and basically it was about promoting this within an inch of its life and just getting as many people to come back and give us mood data on, on these things. So that gives you an idea of um, the, the kind of how it worked. The, it played the theme tune to you, it brought up the questions. You were given one of six moods, that was random. Um, you were asked to guess the genre, which was kind of a measure of did you kind of know what it was? And then we would either ask you if you'd explicitly heard it before, or that question was did, did you like it? Because that's equally as important for us. And also we have to do a lot of press releases. When we do a big um, experiment, we have to do press releases as well. So things like the most liked theme tune, the least liked theme tune, they're really interesting things that we need to eat that up a bit of that. Um, so in terms of what I did with this, this is all about, again, designing the experiment, making sure that um, the moods that they were given were counterbalanced, so making sure everything was very random, so it didn't matter which next participant came in, we were getting a good range of data, um, and a good range of all the moods as well. Um, so it sort of, we had to decide things like, how many theme tunes are we going to give them, when are they going to get bored? Um, each theme tune was about 20 seconds, so in the end we gave them five theme tunes. We wanted to be quick online surveys, people hate doing them really, unless they're those weird people that go and find them, um, which then you don't want their results anyway. Um, but yeah, so you've got to think of, you've got to keep people interested, come straight, sit down, oh, I'm reminiscing over this theme tune, excellent, next, 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 and, and out. You, you really need to be quick and keep them engaged, otherwise they start clicking the middle button all the time, that's really annoying. Um, how many questions on the page, we wanted to make sure that it was on that one page. A lot of surveys, it's click next page, click next page, click next page. We don't want to do that, we want them to be able to 
remember that theme tune within answering those questions. So we can't have too many questions, we might have forgotten what they've just heard. So it's like things like that that you've got to think of, and wording as well, wording of the questions. Make sure that it's really clear. And if you're not sure, ask somebody to read it and see what they understand from it. What does that question mean to you? What are you expected to do? And that, that can actually tell you quite a lot whether you, knowing you're very inside a project, you know what it is, don't necessarily, other people don't necessarily what you're, know what you're trying to do. So it's always good to just ask, ask friends and stuff, you know, very early on. You can always do your UX research, just ad hoc here and there, just always look all, all along the way. So for this, um, I also had to do, we actually got a design agency to do this, so my part in terms of design was just wire draping and just making sure that it was um, adhering to kind of usability things that we wanted. They kept trying to want to put fancy buttons in, which I kept fighting with them. We don't want fancy buttons, I just want people to be able to know what they've ticked. So it's kind of this, sometimes there's this bit of a trade-off between design and usability. Sometimes they don't necessarily fit together quite nicely. You've got to find somewhere in the middle. It may look pretty, but people understand whether that button's on and off. It's quite important. Um, I wasn't involved in the analysis of the, da the data, they did that in SPSS, so I got out of that one. Um, this is a, um, another thing uh, looking at um, basically the potential to do kind of field research and in BBC, like I said, we don't just look at consumers, we also look at people in our studios who make the programmes. There's a lot of technology that goes on behind the scenes and R&D are responsible for developing that and making that better. Um, so production labs is a section of R&D and basically you set up a pseudo production environment because it's very, very expensive to run a production, especially if we're just testing something. People don't want to do that, they don't want to give us the time, they don't want to give us the money. So we set up our own and then we can bring in new technologies and we can test them iteratively within that environment. because. If you give a production company a brand new piece of technology and fundamentally that thing doesn't work for them, they're just going to drop it straight away, five minutes in, that's no use to us, we don't want to see any more of what you've got, leave us alone, we, because it's every, everything's fast paced and it's pretty nightmarish in that kind of um, environment. So this was something where we were testing um, uh, a production assistant sits in the gallery, which is where you put all the screens, watching the production going on. Every shot that is taken, the director um, is giving them information. That's a good shot, that's not a good shot, that's good from that line, pick up from there. And the whole time, the production assistant is making notes on that. So when it goes to the editor, the editor gets the notes through and knows shot three is no good, shot four is great from this point. They know all of that and it speeds up the editing process. But at the moment, it's all paper-based. It's really archaic. They're basically just still writing on notes like they used to. They're, they're putting tram lines down the script, which is just noting off at what point in the script each um, clip is related to. So in R&D, um, the guys have been developing um, a computer-based system that feeds into the computer-based system where actually all the clips go. So you've got all the clips in one place, but you've also got all the notes in one place as well. Brand new, never been used before, they're quite stuck in their ways, so we set up a production lab. Um, and as you can see, it's not that pretty, but it was more about what's the kind of functionality that we need, what do people really not get on with, what do people um, really like about it. Sat them here, we had two production assistants, and the other thing is, is kind of making sure that you're not having ordering effects when you're doing um, an experiment. So don't give both participants paper and then the computer. Vary it around because you never know whether the paper's going to have an impact on what they do on the computer and vice versa. So you, you, you need to um, think about that as well. Um, this experiment was mainly observation. We didn't want to interrupt them. It was very just watching from the shadows. Um, seeing how they got on, noting anything that they said, and then during breaks we would ask them more formal questions. So, what did you find useful? What did you like? What was really frustrating? Is there any ways in which you would have expected it to work? And things like that. Um, so from this, 
we put together a recommendations document which basically says, which is looks at the design and looks at the functionality of the system and, and, and basically makes recommendations on how we think that it can be better. Um, you can't really see them there. But they had um, basically what we found out, because we put it with a production system and a production environment, <coughs> we always thought that on paper, when a shot is good, they circle it. And when it's not, they don't. This was interpreted in the system to ticking good or no good, when actually they didn't translate to that because it, the uncircled items in the list didn't necessarily mean they were no good, it just didn't mean that they were the best one. The circled one was the best one. So they were very reluctant to tick no good because they assumed the editor would need to look at the clip when there might be something in there that they can use. A lot of the time, especially with fast paced programs like EastEnders and things, a lot of the time they're just chunking together what they've got. They've got, you know, two minutes to to um, the end of the program, they just have to add extra bits in. So they have to go back through the not as good clips to put those bits in. So that's really interesting to us. We would never have known that, have, not having watched them or talked to them about the process. Um, just kind of quickly, classic kind of usability testing. Um, this is a lot of the time when you become a usability research and the designer, you're kind of expected to do this very fast paced, we've designed this, does it work? Um, and so this was one of our red button services for Glastonbury. Um, these are interactive templates, so um, programs can just put in text and pictures, we just send them the template um, with all the functionality of how it works, how you navigate through it. So they designed three, they basically wanted to know they all works and they were completely usable to find their way through them. So, already been designed, everybody, all the decisions have been made, they're given to us, we get participants in. And this is more kind of um, a task-based um, analysis that I'm sure you'll, you'll look at later. Um, where, so this is, you know, a very pretty wireframe. So I know the journeys that you can go through this prototype when I get people in. Um, and so, once I've got that, I can think of all the issues that we've got, like we're not sure, there were things like, we weren't sure whether people knew how many items there were in the list, or where they were in the list, things like that. How deep could you go in a hierarchy before somebody got lost? Those are the kind of things we didn't know the answer to, and we're not going to guess, but we can engineer that into the study to kind of look at those things. So, um, I could go through this and I could find places where I could ask them to go. So you say, you know, find Beyonce in Saturday Highlights, whatever. Very task-based system, and then you watch how they go about completing that task and get them to think out loud as well, so you can monitor everything that they, what they're saying. Um, so again, I've said a bit about counterbalancing. So here are my participants. I know if they've used Red Button before, I know if they've used iPlayer before, and therefore I can make sure that I divvy up the templates, because we can give them all three, to, um, to make sure we get a widespread of different ages, different um, abilities, um, genders and things to each template. There's no point giving template one to all 16 year olds and template two to all 50 year olds. That's just not going to give you a nice skew of how people interact and how people expect these things to work. So, like I said, for a lab-based setting again, get them to come in. One thing is, because you put them in front of the TV, you give them a remote, all of a sudden they think they're on show and they are expected to perform. You have to spend the first 10-15 minutes making them feel comfortable in the room, making them feel like we're not testing them. Um, that's really important. Sit back, let them play with it, let them get lost, let them break it, that's fun. Just you know, until they get more comfortable with what they're having to do. And then you get you give them tasks, like I said, you know, can you find out say in Saturday highlights? And then you watch them how they go through it. Whilst people in the control room are taking notes on all the things that they they get confused about. And then if you see them do something, you know, let them do something, but then you can always say, Well what what, what did you think that was going to be? When you clicked there, where did you think that was going to take you? Stuff like that, so you can measure their expectations as well. Um, so, in terms of um, analysis of stuff like this, 
Um, you may have heard there's lots of that processing top down. Um, a lot of the stuff that we do, because we don't really want to um, affect the data, is a bottom up process. So you're just pulling out anything interesting in the data. The process we use is good old sticky, sticky notes. And basically, you just pull out anything that was said and you stick it on the board. You've got this mass array of post it notes. You don't really know what to do with it, but you start finding themes and you start seeing visually how big a problem is. So if you've got a lot of people saying this one thing about navigation, you know that that really needs to be fixed straight away because everybody found that a problem. And then you might have little clusters where you've got two or three things that people have said. That's the other thing about UX, don't make all the changes. <laughs> it's very tempting to get a lot of uh, results in and think, right, we need to tick all of these boxes. They said A, B and C, this thing now needs to do A, B and C. Got to put it in context. If only three people have said it about something in particular, there might be another way around it, or it might not actually be a problem with that one thing. So you have to really keep it in context whilst you're analysing as well. So yeah, from this, I would write a report, recommendations. Um, again, this is for designers and developers, so you have to make sure that when you write and report some things, that your language is for your audience because that's really important. If I can slip into scientific speak quite often, but a lot of the time I'm working with project managers who have no idea what I'm talking about. So if I want people to take on my recommendations, I have to make sure that I'm giving it to them in a, in a manageable, nice way. Um, so a couple of things. I went through all of my MSc before I came here and had to look through all the things that I was taught. I use a lot of what I was taught. It's just that there's constraints within the business that don't allow me to do things as I wish. If, you know, money, time, things. So, I suppose the difference with university is you pay for participants when you go into industry. So, you don't have to just use your five friends anymore. You can actually pay for, you know, five, 65 plus to come in and they'll actually know because your friends probably don't know what they want. Um, but, you know, when you're at uni, you know what you're going to use. Um, so, yeah, that gives you, um, it gives you freedom to choose people, but you have to be very careful with your sampling. You have to make sure that the people that you're choosing are ticking the exact boxes. So I have visually impaired participants. What does that mean? What does, visual, what does severely visually impaired mean compared to moderately visually impaired? I didn't know. I had to go and look it up. And then you have to think of not just is this your eye test result? You have to think, do you do this? Do you usually do that? Do you use a cane? What visual age do you use? So you have to think about that when you're screening for participants. A lot of different questions that you have to ask them in order to get the right type of people through the door. Um, don't know if you've heard it yet, you might have heard it. Quick and dirty, that's HCI research. I'm a psychologist, so it really pains me that I have to do things very quickly, very dirty, because basically you're expected to walk in, you're expected to assess something, the next day they want the results, the next day the developer wants to make the changes, the next day they want to test it again. You, can't, you don't have time to you know, overanalyze your methodology and think you've just got to do the best you can within the time you've got and the money you've got as well. Um, Uh, yes, okay, so UX, the utopia.